the languages then became the national languages from 1918, uh, when uh, all three Baltic states declared their independence in that incredible turmoil at the end of World War I, when both Germany and Russia lost the war. Uh, the independence period, just very quickly, we, Estonian and Latvian, were the national languages. The Estonian, that was enshrined in the constitution, in Latvian, in, in legislation. Um, uh, though they continued to be very multilingual, of course, German, Russian used other languages as well. Multilingualism was very common. The Protestant spirit was seen very much in the very high educational levels in the Baltic states between the two world wars. The, Estonia and Latvia had the highest percentage of tertiary educated people, of tertiary students in the whole of Europe. Um, so this was a very, very bookish society because education had been the only way in which you could advance um, rather than business or property or so on, which tended to be in the hands of others. Um, it was through education that the Estonians and Latvians could advance. Uh, there were minority policies and at the end of World War I, as you know, um, the Versailles Treaty and the League of Nations instituted uh, strict minority policies. You had to agree with these policies to be accepted as a member of the League of Nations. Both these countries were members of the League of Nations. And these minority policies were... Uh, were very patchy in all of Eastern Europe, but they probably worked as well in the Baltic states as anywhere. And some of the leaders um, from um, Estonia and Latvia of the minority movements, particularly the Germans, um, were the founders of the first conference of nationalities that began in 1925 and which then um, uh, promoted the use of minority languages in, in various countries along the lines of the Versailles Agreements and the League of Nations until those organisations were taken over by Nazi Germany and used for their purposes. And this was uh, a little reminder, I suppose, of how minority politics and minority populations can be used by other countries. And I think in the Baltic states we see some analogy between the way that Germany used its German minorities between the two world wars and now how Russia is using its minorities, not just in the Baltic states, but in all the other parts of what they call the near abroad. Um, there was a national turn after 1934. There were coups in the two countries and very mild authoritarian regimes came in um, so there was a stronger promotion of the titular languages. The um, image of the Baltics during this independence period, I, know, I, I told you how educated they were, but this is, this is the, the reality. Um, they were basically still rural economies um, with a uh, very pronounced urban culture as well. And the rural economies were very capable. Uh, the German landlords um, were thrown off the land. There was land reform. It was given to the local farmers. And they were able to produce dairy products and these lovely pork products that you see here um, that competed anywhere in Europe. Um, and this uh, piglet's paradise came to an end with this moment, the signing of the Molotov Ribbentrop Treaty in August 1939. That's Molotov at the table. Behind him, the pompous looking one is um, Ribbentrop, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister. And the laughing one is Josef Stalin, Jugashvili. Um, uh, Solzhenitsyn writes in the first circle that the only person that Stalin ever trusted was Hitler. Uh, they created the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact um, to divide up Eastern Europe between them. This gave Germany a free hand to start the war against Poland and then Russia joined in a few weeks later to take the eastern part of Poland. As a result of this treaty also, there were demands placed on the three Baltic states and Finland um, that they um, house um, Soviet military establishments. Um, Finland resisted and went to the Winter War. The three Baltic states were really blackmailed into agreeing with this and the Soviets occupied. And then after sham elections, the, um, the three Baltic states were incorporated into the Soviet Union.
an incorporation that was not recognised by Western countries. There followed three occupations, the Soviet Union 40, 41, Germany 41 to 44, um, and the Soviet Union returned in 44, um, and that's when many Balts, uh, 100,000 from Estonia, uh, slightly more from, from Latvia and Lithuania, actually left those countries to go to the, to go to the West. Uh, most Germans uh, actually left the Baltics after the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, Hitler called them home. Uh, most of them went. A couple didn't. A few didn't, but most went. Uh, and most Jews were killed in World War II. So these sort of very diverse societies um, were very much changed as a result of this. And during the Soviet Union, this massive influx of Soviet settlers. And just how big the... Uh, um, the influx was. Um, the census of the 1920s and 1930s show the titular nationals, that is Estonians in Estonia, Latvians, Lith Lat Latvia, Lithuanians, Lithuania, <laughs> their percentages, Latvians always much more mixed than, than the other countries. But we see this decline. Uh, Estonians were 92% of the population in the 1920s and 30s. That was reduced to 61.5% at the last Soviet census of 1989. Latvians in Latvia, 73%, reduced to 52%, almost a minority in that, in that country. Lithuanians had other issues, and uh, the Lithuanians um, had different politics and were, in, in a way, more clever, but also just more fortunate. They were more rural. They argued they couldn't take so many Soviet settlers because they were rural they were poor, they were backward, they really needed help, but we, they didn't need people. Um, and so their, uh, uh, their, um, uh, the level of, of Soviet settlers there was much less and they more or less retained their own, uh, uh, own percentage uh, as a result of this. They, the proportion of the titulars has gone up so that in the 2001 censuses, um, we do find that the, um, the titulars are now more. There were quite a number of um, Slavs, um, Russians and others who've left the Baltic states. Um, but um, you see just how close they came to being a minority in their own country um, as a result of the, of the Soviet settler period. And the, um, the uh, claiming proficiency in the language because the Russians were self-sufficient in their own language only 15% of non-Estonians in Estonia um, said they, they knew Estonian, claimed they knew Estonian, 20% in Latvia, 35% in Lithuania. Again, slightly different politics and social factors in Lithuania. We'll come back and, and, and uh, Delaney will also talk about those figures when we get there. The language change in the Soviet period, growing use and status of Russian. Um, it, uh, Russian, interestingly, was not an official language at the, at the time. This is very strange. Um, we had growing what we call asymmetric bilingualism. In other words, the local Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians had to become bilingual in their language and Russian. Russians could remain monolingual in their language. There were a growing number of domains where Russian was favoured in work and so on, um, uh, in higher education. Uh, and there was strict control and censorship over Estonian and Latvian literature, films and so on. Again, Delaney will talk more about that. And a feature that's very important is that um, not all the Soviet period settlers, of course, were Russians. They came from all the other parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, there were Georgians and Ukrainians and Belarus and Armenians and all the rest of them. But what tended to happen was a process of Russification in the countries. So um, the, 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 the non-Russians who came to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, tended to go to Russian schools, tended to identify with Russian, tended often to switch to Russian, uh, even as a home language. Um, so you had this process of internal Russification within the Baltic states. And this regime was a very interesting one. I mentioned that Russia was not an official language. Russia was only made an official language in the Soviet Union in the late 1980s as Gorbachev's desperate attempt to save something. Uh, Lenin always proclaimed the equality of languages and the Soviet Union had no one official language. And, uh, but uh, there were um, Stalinist and certainly Brezhnev favoring of Russian. 
and we saw this in many, in many ways. In education, there were two streams in schools and universities. We had uh, Estonian or Latvian stream schools, um, university courses, Russian um, stream universities and so on um, courses. And the, um, there, was also, uh, uh, there was also quite a lot of segregation. There was very little taught about the Baltic states except official Soviet history and so on. So it was a rewriting of the history. Um, and there was a self-sufficiency of the Russian settlers. Um, Brezhnev would pronounce that uh, a Russian should be able to live comfortably anywhere in the Soviet Union, um, and that had uh, linguistic uh, consequences. Despite that, the Estonians and Latvians stuck to their language, um, high levels of language maintenance, high levels of language loyalty, um, and very few, uh, we find very few Estonians and Latvians actually um, adopting um, Russian or, or other languages as a, a native language. So despite this heavy influence of the Soviet Union, there was very strong language, language loyalty. 